This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. Here it is, another episode of the 21.5 Show, a podcast that has been specifically curated and created for professional pilots, hosted by two professional pilots. My name is Dylan, a professional pilot in business aviation, joined by my friend, Valtteri Bottas, (laughs) Formula One driver. (laughs) You might have a cooler job than us. Uh, My name is Max. I'm a pilot in the airline business as well as business aviation uh all the things max is wearing a valtteri bottas hat um <laughs> if you're a formula formula one fan then you'll know that uh, the monaco gp just happened this weekend um and we're both fans and it's funny because it's like the most prestigious race in the whole I thing know. and it's a, also actually, it's the just worst like, race <laughs> and it's the worst race to watch it's terrible um, <laughs> Dude, it's uh, but i bet you how much you want to bet it's going to be different next year the outcry they, this year I, is just yeah, it overwhelming. Was just like a parade. Everyone's yeah. had enough. I'd be Max curious Verstappen to hear. Starts in sixth and ends in sixth. That, yeah, that doesn't happen. So yeah, exactly. I'd be curious to hear. I know we've had a few friends uh, over the years fly out to that event, fly folks there. Um, yeah, you know, they ever if you got the box, you're on a yacht watching that <laughs> Dude, race. That's it's so a, cool. Yeah, that would be the best an event. That might be the pinnacle. Yeah, I was going to say, would that be... The pinnacle like, of watching the pinnacle of motorsport would be on a yeah. yacht in Monaco. That would be a tough one to top. Have you flown into Nice before? Yeah. A few, yeah several times, actually. Really? Mm-hmm. It, but you can't usually stay, right? You Don't you just have to... Uh, when I was there, we stayed. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. This was... The, I haven't flown into Nice, though, in quite some time. That was back in Good the... Good for you! G3 charter days. <laughs> Was a minute. That was a minute ago. I think I, I may have flew in there under partner. I can't remember, but I've flown in there a few times. <sighs> That's on my list. I really want to do that. It's cool. Well, Max, let's. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today. Um, mailbag and flight advice, of course, as usual. More comments on the luggage reviews, so we'll dive into some of those. But here's where I want to start. I survived the great cicada fiasco of 2024 so far. Um, if, if folks are not up to date on what's going on, uh, cicadas, I mean, how much do you know about them? Cause I don't know a ton. I know they like burrow, they, they like lay their eggs. Yeah. Right they're like in the ground. Like, right. And then yeah. they, they hang out and then they emerge. Right. Like in a period these, of years. Right. And then, correct. Yeah. And then they're everywhere and they make a bunch of noise and yes. Do they leave all like their exoskeletons? All they, sh- they molt. Yes. Is that those? Yeah. yeah okay. And they molt. And then there's in these broods. Like hatch or not hatch, whatever, emerge in different time cycles. So one's like every 17 years, one's every 14 years. And so they they have these convergences of these different broods. So in certain <laughs> years, they these two they overlap and then it's like the crazy, um, like you know, massive. I think they I, one article I read said trillions of these bugs okay. are, are now don't tell us what this has to do with aviation. That's what everyone's trying to figure uh, out right I, now. I'm getting there, believe me. So this is the worst year. I saw I've read articles. The the year varies, but it's somewhere in the early 1800s was the last time we had this... Um, the convergence this of broods of this magnitude, would you say? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love um, to talk about the broods. That's right. Brood. You've clearly like done a lot of 19. research on yeah. this. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you why. Um, <laughs> so it turns out back in the early 1800s, Honeywell had not yet manufactured the uh, 150 auxiliary power unit, which is in use today. <laughs> Um, but, uh, if it would have existed, then they would have found out that there's a specific brood that is attracted to the noise and the vibrations of that APU, especially the one that's in the challenger. Um, I don't know if it's, I mean, that, uh, that 150 APU is in a lot of different airplanes. I think it's in the 280 as well, right? Oh, dude, it's in the 280, yeah. the G4, it's in the G504. It's, in it's in tons. It's in everything. So I don't know if this is just a Challenger specific problem, although, because I'm in the Challenger world and we're seeing it, but um, it, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's other aircraft as well. 
Uh, so we fly in to um, Nashville in the, and we park, and this is the John Toon Airport, not the International Airport. And uh, my my co star says, "Oh, there's some cicadas there. We got to keep an eye out that on that when we parked." So we shut everything down. And Wait, did then, you have the AP running? Yeah, after you landed. Mm-hmm. After we landed, yeah, but only for maybe five minutes. And and he was like, "We've got to uh, keep an eye on that because they those AP those cicadas are attracted to the APU. And I was like, "Oh, really? I didn't know that." And he's like, "Yeah." And he showed me the group post from the our Challenger Facebook group about this. And he's like, "This was a huge problem a few years ago with this specific brood." So, anyways, flash forward two days for departure. We come out. Our airplane's not online. We're like, "What's going on?" And they're like, "Oh, we were gonna." tow you out but the the challenger where that's sitting on the ramp right now was supposed to have been gone but they're broken down and so we there was no room to bring you out and when we saw the pilots walking in and i was like i wonder if this is the cicada thing sure enough we asked them and they're like yep we couldn't the apu was running everything was normal but they when they went to turn the start the engine they couldn't get any n2 rotation so uh, these cicadas, they go in the inlet when the APU is running because they like the noise, and then they block uh, that air inlet into the into the APU. Like in well, there's like the, a screen, like, and they all pile yeah, up on there, right? They pile up on that screen, and so uh, we're like, we asked them, and they're like, "Yep, for sure." So, so they ended up having there's no they, and there was no huffer cart at the airport and so they had to have maintenance come out and the maintenance was taking the their APU apart and we're trying to figure out what to do and so uh m- my co-star uh, my better half it was like okay you know he, his he had to really good came up with a really good game plan on what to do and um so we essentially ran the APU just for a couple minutes got it started got that right engine going shut the apu off and even that the 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 right engine the 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 cicadas just started swarming the plane they were on the landing gear they were just everywhere um so they love that noise and so we were fortunate that um we saw that other airplane and saw how quickly things went bad and we were able to to avoid that so with maybe a cumulative of let's say five minutes of the apu running on arrival plus another two minutes or three minutes on the ground for start we when we flew back it was um our mechanics opened up the apu and there was a dozen bugs already in there in the span of just a couple minutes yeah that's so. really this is a this is a post i did a quick search of the 280 280- page too yeah and same thing like same with the 280 yeah. this was that yeah. was actually from 21 but um yeah, yeah i think 21 was the last year there's it's not every brood is the same and so it's this specific <laughs> one so i actually pulled that map up i'll post that on our social media because it's in, in, only map? in certain parts of the country what's that yeah the brood, the brood map. Oh, you haven't been to map? broodmap.com <laughs> i can't deal cicada with you brood map. About cicada broods much longer yeah like you're exactly a, yeah um, we've reached a new low. It's this, it's summer. There's not much to talk about. Listen, we're just, we're grasping at straws here. But then I that then I was going to ask you, and I forgot to ask you because you flew to Nashville a couple days later in the 737. Any yeah, problems? Not a cicada in sight. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, the, Johnny, we haven't got an email. Or nothing. Interesting. So I don't. I, I, maybe it is really that 150 APU is just the. Could be the real could be so i uh, word to the wise if you pull up on the ramp and you see cicadas think about shutting it down and do uh, a dark shutdown don't fire dark up that shutdown. APU. that's right <laughs> that thing till you, you can need yeah. to start and and on start get that engine turning as quick as you can interesting so, all right yeah good to know so, yeah another public service announcement public Dylan service and his announcement. cicada broods yeah he's been tracking the broods very carefully as they Cover the we're, U.S. We're monitoring the situation. Well, I did because I did pull that map up because I'm like, is this going? Are these going to be in Arizona <laughs> or like? Dude, it's funny weird, because like, like, were they? Are they going to make? No, a it's all mostly like um, between like, like, yeah, it's like between sort of like Arkansas, Tennessee, Chicago. I mean, there's definitely some like Midwest, St. Louis, you know. So definitely. Well, I'll let you know. I'll be in Milwaukee uh, tomorrow for 
brief period of time, I'll report back on the status okay. of the broods in Milwaukee. Yeah, keep us posted on on uh, the brood. Maybe you can update the brood map. Yeah, I think I will. <laughs> Make sure you send it. Yeah, it'll be very important. I'm trying to look uh, at the. Uh, I'm trying funny. to find the name of this brood here. I have on the brood map. Oh, I don't have it. But yeah, Atlanta was another city um, that uh, that had it there. So just just be careful out there. God, this is this trip just I'm on, on starting shirt. tomorrow is about as close mm-hmm. as an airline trip gets to a corporate trip. Let's, it's two legs a day. I okay. block 14 hours, but uh, you mean get paid for 20, of course. But mm-hmm. and it's like two legs to Dallas, two legs to Santa Barbara and the Hilton on the beach. Oh, and then two legs home, home by 11:30. Like that's that's pretty that's gentleman, a gentleman's trip, really for the for the airline situation. So it's Leisure a three-day trip. Baby. Yeah. So six total legs. Yeah. Look at you. I know. Look at, and it's, most of it's all the furthest east I got to go is Milwaukee. Then it's all out west. Stay away from all those thunderstorms that are just hammering. Wow. Dallas and Hugh. Oh, actually, I got to go to Dallas. <laughs> but hopefully, yeah, if you don't like the weather there, just wait five minutes. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, any other all right. right. What uh, else? Uh, enough on the cicadas. Uh, just watch out. Enough from Formula uh, One. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We've, we've, we're the hitting all the topics GP. right now. Yeah, everyone's like looking at their phone right now. Like, like, what are we doing? Is... I think we'll just have to. We'll get there. Everyone, else. stick yeah. with us. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay. uh, anything? Any, any ex- a- a- adventures uh, you've encountered lately in the cockpit? I don't have anything very significant to report. No, everything's okay. been uh, real smooth sailing, if you will. Good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, that being said, oh. all I did was that Nashville turn last week, so it wasn't That's a lot right. of time. Oh, yeah, because we talked to you while you were driving else. to that. How yeah. many, did you have any bachelorette parties on that? You must have. Oh yeah, somebody matching T-shirts, the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, there's certain flights where you don't come out of the cockpit, and there's certain flights you do when everyone's getting off the airplane. Usually, Nashville is a good one for some peach bowl watching. Las Vegas, of course. Especially yep. the evening flights, especially the burping yep. to Las Vegas flights. Um, yeah, that's definitely when yeah. you get off and see what the uh, clientele, what the customer base just kind looks of, like. Just kind of do a quick a vibe check is really what it's yeah, called, it's, right? It's totally it's it's always it's funny to see you know because certain places just like it's uninteresting. But what about the Sunday afternoon like Vegas departure flight? That's got to be <laughs> kind of interesting to watch the people board and they're just like. Just, I would imagine the range of emotions. Like you have some people that are like I don't staring know. You, into the Vegas abyss. is all over the place because you got a lot of people yeah. connecting too that have nothing to yeah, do with going to Las true. Vegas. You know, it's just, and that's how Nashville's kind of turned out too. But yeah, I guess that's true. Now all that's right. a base. No good metrics there. All right. Um, okay. Well, I guess that's it uh, for the cockpit update. Uh, Should we get out the book club going? Oh, we do have the book club, but hold on. One more thing. One other update I just discovered, a little factoid. If you're a golfer like me, uh, I recently discovered that if you want to play Pebble Beach, for a long time people said, you know, if you want to play Pebble Beach, you got to stay at their lodge and um, yeah, you got to pay, you know, the 900 bucks a night to get a tea time. But I found out that they also have another option where you can book a tea time. The general public can book a tea time, but it has to be just the day prior. Well, how so, many tea times are available in the summer, the day depends. prior? It just depends on the day. So they said uh, the articles I were reading said if you're a single or maybe two people, you might actually you have a pretty good chance. Now, you may not be able to pick your time, but if you're a corporate pilot and you're out there and you're sitting for a few days. So did you it, do it's this? Like per- it's perfect. I would. I would have. If I was with uh, somebody that w- also was pl- – it's like almost 600 bucks. So. so why didn't you just go by yourself? Well, plus caddy. If you it's caddy do it right, tip, you really want to have a caddy. Exactly. So, you know, it just kind of depends. I wasn't ready to shell that out uh, by myself. I'd rather do it, wait and do it with, you know, you or some or my dad or something like that. God, I tell you, when the weather is perfect out there, Dylan, yeah. just walking Pebble Shut Beach up. with the caddy, no, it yeah. just doesn't get much better. That's quiet. We talked about the pinnacle of motorsport. That may be the pinnacle of <laughs> pinnacle golf. Pinnacle of golf. Uh, listen, when you've played as many golf courses as Max, he, he just listen. has such a wide variety to, to compare it to. It's <laughs> well, unbelievable. Listen, you say you're a golfer. I remember asking you to golf this morning, and you turned me down. So I know. I did. And I golfed yesterday. we had to record so. a show. 
<laughs> yeah, that's why. We could have done all this right. in the golf cart. We did it on the way to work. Yesterday. I know. Last we time. should have. Darn it. Um, all right. Let's jump into the book club. Chapter four. In the, the Public Interest is the title. Yes. Uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a quick summary, Max, uh, of the chapter and kind of the theme. The theme has changed a little bit now. Well, yeah. So, so basically, uh, some airlines, including a big part of that, was Southwest Airlines, have begun to chip away at the base of airline regulation, right? And the, the Civil Aeronautics Board. And, and what is airline regulation? They basically started figuring out ways to go around regulation, whether that's with, you know, girls in hot pants and, or giving away bottles of whiskey and doing all these things because um, their hands were tied in certain areas, such as pricing. <laughs> so, so, you know, basically what they say in the book, regulation had only forced airline executives to engage in mutated forms of competition as a feat of legislation. Deregulation only legitimized behavior that was already taking place. place. So, you know, essentially the kind of the writing is on the wall, but everybody mm-hmm. was terrified of it, right? Um, you know, they say to call reg- deregulation a mistake as many people would for at least a dozen years to follow was a waste of breath. Whether wise or misguided as a piece of public policy, deregulation had to happen. And some people saw that and some people certainly did not. Most did not, I would say. Yeah. I mean, Herb Kelleher certainly did. Um, but one of the big surprises was that uh, Ferris, the CEO of United, was one of the only big airline people that were like, I'm, I'm not going to stand against this. So. Yeah, they were so big. You know, they had, I think, 300 airplanes at the time, maybe the biggest airline, the best route structure. And they thought, we're going to we're going to be OK. It's going to be tough. I think in the book, it said three or they thought it was going to be three or four rough years. But they're like, we, we can survive. And this is why we think we can we can do it, because he, they mentioned like when United would apply for a new route. It'd either be declined or they'd give it to somebody else because they were just never going to give the biggest airline any new stuff. Yeah. So they were kind of boxed in. Well, and, and everyone's terrified of the small airlines providing all yeah. this competition against these mm-hmm. big unionized airlines. Like, how are we supposed to yep. compete? But United's like, you know what? We have a ton of airplanes. They they had approaching a billion dollars back then in the bank. Big network. Um, yep. Yeah, and they said, you know, we can we can market ourselves out of this, leveraging our big network and our reliability and safety record and all of these things. Um, and so I thought that was interesting how everyone else was lobbying and, 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 yep. uh, trying to get this to not pass. And even Crandall was there and, and, uh, said something hilarious. Um, yeah, he was, them. he was a uh, very colorful choice of words. Yeah. Um, but so okay. So that's, that, that's one side of the chapter, but then the other side of the chapter really focuses on what we don't, what is not obvious, and that is the political maneuvering and the political motivations that people have to make change, right? And it's just another great example, honestly, to me, of like how politics can really affect, especially airlines, where there are maybe not obvious agendas of people to do things, and that can really affect. You, you know, you as a pilot working in, in this high profile industry. So I, I thought that was fascinating to see all this back channel maneuvering that they're doing. You know, a part of it has to do with a presidential race and they need an issue. What are we going to do? Oh, let's get rid of deregulation. That'll be our kind of our our cause that we can rally around. And then, you know, they maneuvered to install the right person as the chairman of the Civil Aeronautics Board. So just all of these different maneuvers. And you're just like, wow, so much of this is out of control uh, of the actual of the people that it know? affects. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And, and then they also had that part, Max, where they mentioned that they they kind of bought the unions off pretty easily on signing up for deregulation just because we had talked about it earlier in that um, earlier in the book club where I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was essentially where all the airlines would subsidize each other if there was a strike. What yeah. was that called? I can't remember. I can't remember either. Yeah. The like work assistance or whatever. So they basically said, Oh, we'll, we'll give, we'll, we'll give that as the concession because essentially there, a strike meant nothing. There was no, a, a strike. There was no leverage in a strike. And so, they said, "Okay, labor, we will give you the ability to, you know, have your le- your strike be meaningful now." 
And in the book, they said they kind of, that's like selling Manhattan for $24. Yeah. And I didn't, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know, like what. Well, what's the what, fear what, of any unionized workforce is that they have the, the leverage of strike, right? And before, if your union, your airline strike went on strike, you were actually, it actually helped you. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. The book made it sound like the union gave that bargaining chip away for free. Oh, I and I was like, well, I don't really get like what more. I guess they could have had more leverage to give to get more in return. I th- that's what I, I that's what I thought because he said the unions sold Manhattan for twenty four dollars with that decision. But I don't. Yeah, really know. I mean, it, but the unions the too may have had some been had a lot of fear as well, just like the airlines did. Of mm-hmm. oh my god, are we going to lose our jobs? Are we going to go? Is the airline going to go out of business because of this? So yeah, I I guess you look at well, there's so know. much security. In a regulated market, there's so much security. Yeah. And there's then you just don't have to worry. So I guess that was that was their point. So so yeah, it was I thought a really interesting chapter. And it's funny, like we're sort of seeing this, and you're gonna roll your eyes when I talk about this, but we're seeing this happen right now in this current election. There's been this huge um uh announcements fr- uh regarding cryptocurrency. And just the other day, Trump came out and he's like, I'm accepting crypt- cryptocurrency uh, for my campaign. There's this Bitcoin guy that's been in jail for a long time. And they're like, I, Trump says, I'm going to pardon him on day one. And there's been all this legislation about like tax treatment. And then all of a sudden, the Democrats have like completely had to change course <laughs> on their position in like the matter of like 10 days because it's it's becoming this election issue and it's just sort of the same thing in a way where it's like yeah, you never really discount cares. like the the advantages and in in the lever perceived leverage in these elections um for big policy changes that can kind of come through you know so pretty interesting but i but uh good good chapter to to see how it, for me to see like the inner workings of how it actually happens yeah you know? super interesting so so at the end of the day you know President Carter signs the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, right? And what was kind of interesting is, as as Carter spoke and, and addressed the public about the passage of this bill, people realized once the bill was law, more than 2,000 dormant airline routes would instantly be up for grabs. And of course, in their infinite wisdom, the CAB intended to dole out the unused routes in first come, first serve basis. <laughs> so a spectacle ensued on which corporate representatives lined up along Connecticut Avenue entrance to the CAB like rock fans ready to buy concert tickets. Three days before President Carter had even signed the bill, they began showing up with thermos bottles, walkie talkies, sleeping bags, folding chairs. And over the next two days, the line grew to 30 long by the time the bill was actually signed. So... I mean, can you imagine if you're the dude from American that has to go <laughs> camp out in front of the CAB? Right. Here's your gun. All right, Jim. We've got your backpack packed here. We've got a sleeping bag, some snacks, a thermos. <laughs> I mean, what? now go stand out there and get that that uh, Atlantic City to uh, Chicago route. We we need that. Well, what if it's like, all right, uh, next in line. Um, Alaska Airlines. Okay. Uh, what, you know, what route? Oh, you'd like the Puerto Rico route? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, <laughs> well, it looks like we have Puerto Rico available. Uh, is that going to, is that any interest to you? Is that going to uh, work for you or we have the, uh, well, Trenton we don't care. To Next? Palm Beach route. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine what that's the fiasco of what that would be to just, do you just grab every route and then do you just ho- take what the, whatever route you can get and then horse trade? Do they talk about this more in the future? I, I can't remember if they talk more about the root trading stuff later on. Ooh, Max, I forgot to tell you, we're going to have a special guest here a little bit in the show. <laughs> yeah. It just pops onto our screen. It says S with a circle around it. This is very... Yeah. Very exciting. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it uh, for uh, Book Club Chapter 4. We have a link in the show notes if you'd like to jump in um, later on. Uh, and join with us. You can get the book, get this, get the the uh, paperback, carry it in your flight bag, get your street cred in the terminal. I have it on uh, my iPad. So I have yeah, enough to carry or, or so. Kindle if you have to. Whatever you gotta do. So it's gonna do it. All right. Um, special guest, are you there? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Special guest. <laughs> Max still doesn't know who this is. He's getting questioning the look. Or does he? <laughs> Who is this? 
<laughs> Max, this is our friend and colleague and uh, Utah backcountry pilot spokesman, uh, Captain oh, Roy. I was going to guess Roy. Roy, you scared me the other day. I did. I saw an Instagram post, and I thought also thought you crashed your airplane. <laughs> so did my wife. Yeah. But was this intended? People, people did not recognize the blue or the missing blue. So no, no, no it was not yellow intended. cub looks like yellow cub, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but mine's got way more blue in it. Also, I'm on a pretty good streak of not turning it into a pancake either. So <laughs> oh, no. well, listen, this is the first time for everything. That's right. Welcome. What, That's what, true. what do we do? What do we uh, owe the honor? Well, I've got a couple things I wanted to get out of Roy today. Um, we, we're going to talk about our luggage review comments next. And then uh, I tapped Roy to give us a little insight. He's used a, a kind of a unique bag that I wanted to get some information from. And then, as luck would have it, we actually have a very interesting uh, listener email that I know Roy will be able to provide some insight on. So, Roy, if you've got a few minutes oh, and you want to stick around, uh, <laughs> we've got uh, we've got a couple big topics to hit. Oh, I'm I'm ready. Put put me in, Coach. Okay. All right. Um, so we got some emails. Uh, luggage review series. If you don't know, is on YouTube. Um, in the show notes, you can click on the link and, and check out all those videos. Um, we reviewed the strong bags, which Max is what he uses at the airlines. And strong bags has kind of a unique bag, uh, and it's called the Helix. And if you have not seen the Helix. It's a single pole that uh, comes out of the top, and then it's got like this ergonomic handle that you can rotate. So kind of the design philosophy is that it's like super ergonomic, and it's much easier on your arm and your shoulder. So instead of like holding your arm straight back, you can kind of hold it at the side. And I found out that Roy actually had this bag for a period of time. So the listeners were curious uh, about it, Roy. Uh, can you provide us any insight on, on the Helix, Strong Bag Helix? Yes, uh, it's for sale. <laughs> is, is that should be enough of a, of a review, right? Well, I was enticed by it because it was uh, a new thing. I think I actually got it on Kickstarter uh, before it was for sale. And the thing I loved about it, which I love about all strong bag bags, is that everything is completely replaceable. And you can even take the, the fabric of the outside completely off the suitcase, throw it in your washing machine and clean it up. Um, and so I thought it was going to be great. And I thought the handle was a little bit quirky and it is. And I spent a few months using it to try to get used to it because you have to turn it a certain way in order for the extension to lock mm -hmm. so that you can actually push the suitcase. Like if you're getting into an elevator or if you find yourself in a place where you have to like turn your suitcase around it's just like even after months of trying to figure that out, it was still taking brain power to like real like it's like towing a trailer. You never feel like you're completely comfortable with a trailer. And every time you're like, all right, I'm backing it up. Wheels going this way. OK, it looks good because you don't want to be that guy on all those boat ramp videos. <laughs> and so I felt like I was that guy with this stupid suitcase. Um, and that handle <laughs> was just really goofy. And I never... I, I always just use like another bag hanging off the hook. Yeah. And so I never had a third bag to put on top. But if you had a third bag, like a lunchbox or a, a, a cooler or something, there's all these like straps and Velcro. And it's just like this huge pain in the butt where with an old traditional two arms handled suitcase, you just slide it right over and you're right. good to go. It seems like too, Roy, and that so if you worked for one of those airlines that requires you to wear that uh, goofy airline hat, um, and I always see people having it leaned up against the two vertical parts oh. of the handle. So, I mean, did, did that impact you at all? <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the fact that like it wouldn't even fit in the back pocket either was really goofy. Ooh. Um, like your hat. And so, yeah. And it, it seemed like it was a lot smaller than a luggage works. And I know there seems to be like memes going around these days that, People that use luggage worth uh, suitcases are like those people in the old Geico commercials, but it works. It's great. It's robust <laughs> and everything fits. I mean, I, I fit 12 days of clothes and such in a, in a luggage worth stealth bag and I couldn't fit five in that uh, Helix. And I even had all the side pockets too. And it just seemed like it was just one inch shorter everywhere else. And we all know that like the big stealth suitcase will fit in every RJ overhead bin. 
So yeah, it's like I said, it's well designed. It looks great. It's just for sale. I don't like that handle. It's just goofy. Okay. Let me ask you this. It, when it's being used as the as intended, you're pulling it. That handle is vertical instead of horizontal. Did you feel like, oh, okay, this is much less weight on my shoulder? Like, did it feel ergonomically better? Yeah, but at the same time, like the whole time you're you're going down the terminal holding this bag, and you're like, oh, well, this is nice. This is very ergonomic. And then the next thought in your mind is. If this handle breaks, it is going to be the complete opposite of ergonomic, you know, because it's, it's, it seems like it's built strong. But, you know, you can yeah. get a luggage works handle at like almost every major airport these days. You know, I'm going to email this guy and their company and wait a few days to get a part. And then I just have to hold a suitcase like I'm in the 50s. Well, ugh, no, thanks. <laughs> hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Well, well that, very strong that, opinion uh, from Roy. Yeah, I like that, Roy. It's good. So you you were using the stealth still. Yeah, I have whatever the I don't have the carbon fiber one, but I, I sent mine in a few months ago to get overhauled and then they said, Hey, we'll give you this next version up for a discount. So I have it. It works great. I'm still not happy with what's kind of available out there and everyone likes to complain about the bag being heavy. And the reality is, is I use that suitcase for work and work alone. So I could care less if it's heavy or not. I'm, I'm not lifting it up, you know. Hmm. Well, yeah, I guess you have a different, because you're not commuter. So you're not lifting it into the overhead. And you probably fly yeah. a co- an airplane with a cockpit where you can just leave the bag in the cockpit, right? Can you put that in the 220? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's nice. It, and if if there were a nicer suitcase, like that did all those things, but was also as robust, then I might be inclined, but is it really worth like double the cost? You know, I mean, come on, we're pilots, we're cheap. I'd like mm. to, I think we should interview a hotel van driver and see what their opinion is of all the different bags. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to tip an additional dollar? These pilots the, uh... are these steel bags. They tore a rotator cuff. I had to retire. <laughs> You should do a segment uh, where yeah, you ask them like right. how, how how they can determine the tip, you know, like based on the luggage. Yeah. Like, is this person going to tip more or less? Based than on average? They have like a picture. Yeah, they should right. have like they... a picture on the inside of the van door with a photo of the bag and then like the dollar amount. You know, that's funny. So I got a question for you, Roy. How much do you tip the van drivers now? Uh, well, you know why pilots tip van drivers with two dollar bills, right? <laughs> why? Because you get the reaction of a five dollar bill for less than half the cost. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, uh, t- I tip two dollar bills. You have them? Oh yeah, you get I get bands of them uh, from the bank every once in a while. Wow. That's... And uh, and they're nice. And depending on the driver, like I had a drive from Burbank to John Wayne. And it was an hour long drive in the middle of the night. And I definitely tipped that guy more than two dollars because yeah. first off, it was a long drive. But second of all, man, we talked for an hour about Taco Bell and it was amazing. <laughs> and I've just it's changed my mind on how I approach the, the bell. So Wow. Okay. It was well worth the we'll, investment. We'll save that. Yeah, we'll do an emergency <laughs> episode on that uh, another time. Um, interesting. So what Max what so Roy's doing you doing two dollars. What do you do, Max? Uh, I always tip two dollars, but it's funny too because even I still even see some captains like pull out the one dollar bill. I'm like, bro, like you, it's been a dollar <laughs> tip since like forever, yeah. and you know, inflation's a thing. And so I always pull out my two dollars and make sure it's very visible if the guy pulls out a dollar, make try to make him feel cheap. So do you bring like prior to a trip? Are you are you like getting a bunch of ones? I uh, I, yeah, I usually always get like a hundred bucks worth of ones and have them stashed in my bag. Smart. And then my wife always funnels me when she has ones and I always try and save my ones. You know, it's a whole thing. Yeah. Okay. It's a whole deal. Okay. I like that. Good to know. Um, all right, Max, on to the reviews. Got a few. Do you want to, you want me to read you a couple of the reviews from the luggage, luggage videos? We get yeah. them every day. People are telling the story. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one from CNOS says, actually, I've tried a bunch of bags, including the Briggs. I've gone back to the hated Stealth. I just love the J-hook, the handle, and the nice way it rolls. Though it is super heavy, and if you're not careful, 
it will bite and take a chunk out of people or things. Okay. Um, and then another uh, UAL320 says, you hammer the heavy luggage work bags that we all have grown to hate, but yet you hammer the Aurora for not looking like that bag. Come on, it's a generic black roller bag that, by the way, looks much better than a Travel Pro. It definitely does not look like a flight attendant bag, as you claim. He's talking about the Aurora bag there. I wouldn't say I'm hammering the Luggage Works Aurora bag because it doesn't look like the Stealth. I just, I, there's something visceral about that bag when I look at it that it just doesn't appeal to me. And it's not that it doesn't look like a, a different bag. I just don't well, it's really just the like thing the way that it we've all been accustomed to. The airline yeah. pilot bag is this rectangular, you know, yeah, thing. And because the the luggage works and even the strong bags look the same yeah. from a distance, right? Um, and then everything else looks like a quote unquote flight attendant bag. <laughs> I think is what I, the, yeah, I, is it the reality of the matter. But at the end of the day, it looks like a normal bag. Is what it looks like. Yeah, it looks like it a looks normal like bag a you would Civic. buy at Costco or whatever. Yeah. And it's. And it is great. Yeah, it's a, it's, it looks like a Toyota Corolla. It's just, it's not, looking at it is not going to go, oh my gosh, I love this. I'm so attracted to this bag by the way it looks. You know, it's just. There's it's only one bag that, yeah. that gets that reaction. And that's the yeah. all aluminum Paradox one. Yeah, the sick. Paradox bag, yeah. Um, <clears throat> last one says, uh, the guy in the blue shirt is funny. I think he's referring to you. Uh, I'll bet Briggs and Stratton <laughs> didn't know their engines came with a garment management pocket. <laughs> we made a little goof on uh, Briggs and Riley and Briggs and Stratton. Um, on the other hand, Briggs and Riley baseline collection is super quality luggage at a cost. Thanks for sharing your experience and your thoughts. It's funny. The Briggs and Riley bag has the most views and the most comments. I would not I have expected that. you need to that. make a YouTube video of your, uh, your wheel swap. Oh, yeah, I should. I think that could need, really get yeah, some traction. Yeah, could really bring some traction. I, I'll do that. It's a good point. The, the Achilles heel of the mm -hmm. Briggs and Riley bag is We've solved. solved it. Make sure yeah. that you put the link to the wheels only available on our website. That's right. A very heavy <laughs> Amazon referral code. We yeah. To research we, how to do that. Make sure we get our 5% on the $10 wheels. That's right. Um, can you uh, read the two uh, reviews from uh, Apple iTunes for us below? <sighs> I could. If I had the document up, <laughs> hold on. All right, I'll read the first one while you're scrolling All right, yeah, through. Let's keep uh, you on a roll. One, that's right. We're on a roll here. I mean, I can Listen, read. We, we, uh, we love when folks leave uh, reviews, especially on Apple. Um, we'll happy, happily send you some 215 stickers if you leave us a review and then shoot us an email and give us your mailing address. Uh, we can send that out. I'll be sending some to Outfits O, who wrote, Great podcast. I really enjoy this podcast. The latest episodes on luggage and the latest takes have been excellent. I particularly like the book recommendation and book club. Flexibility is the key to air power. All right. Oh, I'm up. Uh, this is a, f a rare Facebook review, huh? Mm. Commercial pilot, working my way up and greatly appreciate Max and Dylan's 21.5 podcast. Highly recommend whether you are a current pilot or thinking of becoming a professional pilot. A wealth of information and great insight into how the industry works with each and every episode. Thanks for all you do. It has been a huge help in understanding what I'm getting myself into as a professional pilot. Your local AZ pilot friend, Chris. All right. Chris, thank you. Glad you're getting some value out of that. Uh, feel free to leave us a review uh, and shoot us an email, info215podcast.com. On to the mailbag, Max. Lots to discuss but first, do you know who's been bringing us the mailbag for years and years? Of course you do. It's the Advanced Air Crew Academy. Aircrewacademy.com has all of their training, all of their modules available for folks that want to increase their knowledge in aviation or uh, find compliance on education for their flight department. Max, I, I was cruising through their modules today and I found one that I thought was particularly interesting, and I thought we might be able to uh, have a little road show based on this. They have a course on aircraft marshalling. <laughs> and how many times have you been to the FBO and you know you could tell that the person just has no clue what they're doing? And I feel like it'd be so cool if we like had a little gift certificate we could hand out to, <laughs> to that go. person that parked and be like, "Here's here's a two dollar bill." for the tip <laughs> and uh here's a here's a coupon code uh to, for for the marshalling class 
What do you think? Is that a good idea? Now, or is let's that see. Insulting? Maybe adv- maybe Advanced Aircrew Academy will give us a couple of uh, you know yeah marshalling yeah. a ca- marshalling uh, course certificates that we can hand out to those in need. But would we come off as like jerks if we did that, or would that be? Yes, of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> Here. What kind of question is that? <laughs> well, how would you feel if the passenger got off the plane and handed you a uh, a certificate for a, a landing uh, question? <laughs> uh, you know, here you go. Do, do a great flight. Here's a uh, free certificate on landing technique that yeah. I just thought you could use. Yeah. Would you be insulted? That's a good point. Yeah, I would probably be insulted. <laughs> Idiot. But I'll tell you, there's nothing worse than a marshaler that you don't have trust in. That's yeah. I, I remember one time different. too. I was like, I was, uh, "What's that place? Um, Morristown." Mm-hmm. I was there in the winter time, and I'm taxing this G three dude, and on this really small ramp, and there's snow everywhere. It was still snow, it was icy. It was a mess, and he's like, he's yeah. marshalling me between two airplanes, and I'm like, dude, if I slide, I, this is over. And I'm like, yeah. How about no? And I, yeah. I set the brake and just shut down. I'm like, no way, dude. Shut you it can down. tow it. I'm not doing this. <laughs> This yeah, is, I'm out. That's the thing. And, and with airplanes, if you ever get that feeling in your stomach, like something's not right, that's the time to do something. Not just... Or not it. do something. Yeah, or not do something. <laughs> or put an end to something. That's... Yeah. that's. I was like getting... I was like, this is not good. Yeah, I am out on this. I like, yeah, yeah, I've that, had a bro, couple of those. I don't trust you. Where it's just like... It's not... It, where Similar situation. We were parking somewhere in like Connecticut. No, Jackson Hole. We used to go to Jackson Hole all the time with this one job. And in the wintertime, the, the ramp is frozen. And so what do they do? They drive along in these little gators, uh, you know, like these little yeah. golf cart, like John four-wheel Deere drive gator. golf cart type thing. And the marshaller always, like, stops, gets out of the gator, and then it stands next to the nose of the gator and, like, parks us, you know, bring is, like, telling us to come and we're going to stop right in front of this thing. I'm like, dude, we're on a sheet of ice right now. <laughs> If I hit the brakes and nothing happens, like I'm going right into that cart and there's nothing you're going to be able to do in time to be able to figure that out. So I, I would always stop like way away from it because I'm like, this is just not worth well, it. Airplanes are terrible, dude, when it's icy. You have yeah. this one little nose wheel that's yeah. directing the, you know, have you ever seen that when you turn it yeah. and nothing happens? Nothing happens. <laughs> just, yeah. You're just like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's not, not fun. So. So anyways, lots to talk about at marshalling. My favorite, and then I think I told this story on the show. My favorite was, uh, the, I, we used to go into West Virginia all the time, this little airport in West Virginia. And I pulled in one time with this country bumpkin marshalling us in with maybe, you know, one hand. And he had a cigarette in his mouth smoking as he like marshaled us yes. in. Yes. <laughs> ah! just like, That's that awesome. is the first. That was amazing. So that, uh, land, uh, so anyways. Lots to talk about. We could tell marshalling stories all day, but uh, you visit if you've got someone that you need uh, to improve their marshalling, go over to Advanced Aircrew Academy, send them the marshalling module. Maybe Dan will get a coupon for that. And some, we just got to figure out a way, a non-insulting way to to handle that. <laughs> when you find that out, you let me know. You, figure that you know, one out. You, well, you you land and you're like, oh, you come out and tell them like, you're such a great marshaler. Could you watch this and maybe you could provide some input to them on, on your your techniques? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Flattery. Uh, all right, out of the mailbag. Uh, let's kick things off. You want to do the first one? No, you go ahead. All right. It says, hello, guys. First off, I want to say your podcast is the best on the web, entertaining and good information. I would like your thoughts about the latest attempt to eliminate experienced airmen with Congress investigating a rule that crews over the age of 70 under Part 135 and Subpart 91K employers may discriminate hiring. NetJets is spearheading the bill. Why would any charter or fractional operator chase the experienced airmen away when they can not be replaced is beyond me. This is also damaging as the insurance companies will follow suit and refuse to insure over 70 as well. Some are already doing this practice with aircraft owners. By doing this, it only makes the pilot shortage worse. Is the senior airman that uh, it is the senior airman that has the experience and need to mentor the new pilot. It is not enough that the airlines have a age 65 rule, but now to want to destroy 135 as well. Other countries such as Canada and Australia do not have an age limit and no pilot shortage. Lastly, I am very disappointed that MBAA allowed such a bill to pass. An over 70 corporate pilot, not ready to fold my wings. And that's from Bob. Uh, it's such a tough deal because somebody, you know, chronological age is such a tough thing to uh, 
characterize, you know, they're fit for fit to fly. I mean, we've seen people that are in their seventies that look that are great and people that are in their fifties that are struggling. So obviously, uh, Bob is one of the former that's probably in, in good shape and takes care of himself and everything. And, uh, and we've talked to, remember we talked to the former federal air surgeon about yep. cognitive evaluation of pilots. If they, if they could come up with a test that would test your, you know, whatever reaction times or, and blah, blah. And he's like, that is just impossibly difficult to do. So what do you yeah, do? I just, yeah, I know that's the problem is we have to draw, draw this arbitrary line in the sand um, and, and I think, I think most people too, that are not fit to fly, hang it up like before they're forced to, right? Like they're, you know, most people while maybe being in denial, aren't, uh, you know, idiots and, and, but it's always yeah. like anything else. It's always the, the small percentage that maybe, you know, for lack of a better term, ruin it for the rest where maybe there's people that push it too far or whatever. And so now they have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. And I think that the best non-discriminatory way to do it is with age, right? Even though I suppose it is discriminatory in its own. It is. Practice. Yeah. I mean, it, but it, I don't know how else, like, like, like he said, it's just like, how else are we going to do it? But yeah, it's, that's a tough one. And, you know, and, and the, the thing is that we've seen is like, even if you don't have mandatory, um, ages uh from a from legislated numbers there's not that many aviation insurance underwriters anymore i was just gonna say it's not even that Uh, it's just the insurance companies are like no we're good and that's like a whole different thing was like uh, they're private companies you can't or i shouldn't say private those are uh, are companies are not controlled by the government (laughs) so even if there's no law against it if the insurance companies just say nope we're not doing it then th- you really almost have no recourse. So yeah, it's, we've it's heard that really multiple tough. times. Hey, just yeah. as a heads up, uh, we're not going to renew this policy next year. Yeah. Because <laughs> your pilot's uh, yeah. turning Even 70. My last job, uh, we, uh, we had a pilot in like uh, older than 65, and we were already starting to get, um, you know, dec- uh, some carriers declining to quote. Yeah, a decline to quote, or they'll just pri- oh, they'll just jack the price up and, and price or you they'll out, just cr- or just crank the price. And so it's really like you have company policies, insurance, government, right? You know, all three of those are like working in tandem, and and it is a shame because we all can think of pilots in their seventies that would be super sharp and able to fly, and we can all think of pilots in their fifties that need to hang it up now. So yeah, that's that a, tough, a tough one. It's a very tough yep. thing that I don't know that there's. Much you can do. I think, like, let me ask you this, though. I would just identify as a 60-year-old, Bob. That's what I would yeah. do. Oh, yeah. There you do. Because that's what we Nowadays, you can just kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. So. Exactly. Um, let me ask you this, though. Age is just like, a number. Like, now, okay, so we're both in our 40s. We're starting to think, okay, you know, like, in my head, I'm like, okay, you know, I got about 20 or so years. What would you say would be, like, as a person, let's say you're a healthy person for the most part, but like, how do you mentally plan that and think like, well, in 20 years, is it likely I can, you know, 65 legally, am I still going to be able to fly to? Like, do you feel pretty confident thinking that? Or, or do you think, man, there could be like, do you plan on like, you know, by then I, it should be 70, you know, like how do you, have you ever thought about that at all? Uh, yeah, I plan on 65 as a hard line and then it's kind of a see, see what, see what the environment looks like when you get there. Um, but I yeah. feel, I feel like, you know, some of that of your, what you, what you, what can be referred to as health span, right? <laughs> Which, yeah. So you have your lifespan, but your health span, your health span is about what you're able to do as you get older. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that paying attention to that now or even earlier is, is important is in terms of your exercise regimen and, and, you know, just overall general health and how you manage that. And I think that has a huge influence. Now there's genetics in there and there's a lot of other things that are completely Mm -hmm. outside of your control, but some of it, a lot of it is very much in your control. And so I think, I think we all know, if you look around at some people that take care of themselves and some people that don't. And I think, those is going to be very correlative to whether or not you can fly 
into your later years past 65 yeah. because it's just the, you know the the we are we are the term over the hill of when you're 40 40 or 45 you know is is certainly applicable because it's a slow downward trajectory for here and it's it's a yeah. matter of trying to slow that trajectory um by doing stuff and unfortunately all of the things that are most effective at slowing that downward trajectory are very hard in terms of exercising and is the number one thing, you know? And so, yep. Uh, that's why everyone doesn't do it. That's right. And that's why you see certain, and I think the lifestyle of a professional pilot, if, if you're not, if you don't take care of yourself can make things worse, accelerate. So oh, that's why I think you have to absolutely. be be without, really without, careful. Um, without a doubt. You know, a lot of people, I've said this before, like I go to the gym, we, we work out, we work on flexibility, we're working on core strength, a lot of this stuff. To me, those gym sessions is, is like, I think about it like a 401k. I'm making that deposit in for later. Like it's great now and it's nice to be stronger and be able to, you know, chase your kids around and stuff too. But there's also that, that like pilots love to focus on their retirement accounts and all this, but it's like, there's another retirement account you better be making deposits into. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want to enjoy. And the, and the time, it, you know, it's ne- while it's never too late, yeah. the earlier, the better. I mean, it's just, it, and it sucks because it gets, the thing is about it is uh, the older you get, the harder it gets. Yeah. Like I'm, have this like a forearm injury, which is the dumbest thing ever. I am not even sure how I did it, but it just kills. And my knee, I had surgery a few weeks ago. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, but, and I literally, we just, I was just telling you, we were talking about this. I just yeah. got this cold plunge. I got to go get in after this for five minutes and freeze at 50 or whatever, 48 degrees. It's hard. If you it's see miserable. Max in the crew room right now, yeah. this is a good time to challenge him <laughs> to an arm wrestling contest. That yeah, would be good. You could, he could be bested right now. Uh, it's like this is this is what happens when you get older and you have to figure out things to uh try and offset some of that so you can continue to exercise or do whatever you want to do yeah so. all right uh, good discussion great great email bob thank you well, sorry it's time it for another episode for that. we yeah. could do a whole episode yeah. on that which we, we do, should do a whole deal yeah next email max and and we've got roy here uh to to answer this question as well uh, it says, hey, gents, really enjoy the show and the down-to-earth insight into the aviation industry. I started my journey switching from military rotor wing to civil civil aviation last year and discovered your podcast thanks to my sim partner at ATP CTP. The info is great, and I look forward to every episode. I'm behind in the book club, but did order the book hardcover, I'm afraid. I just started at a ULCC, and I'm excited for the next chapters in this career. I do have a pretty specific question about pilot shirts. Why the hate online and on your podcast for long sleeve shirts? I personally think poorly fitted short sleeve shirts with a tie look dorky. Additionally, as someone who burns easily, the little bit of added sun protection seems advantageous. Is it a style thing, an inside joke that I'm still on the outside of, or something else entirely? Thanks, and keep up the great work. And that's from Matt. Uh, for any listeners that don't know, Roy is a long sleeve shirt wearer and advocate. <laughs> so I thought it was appropriate that he be on the call. It's funny, this. it's funny, funny though, because after you read that, and he's like, "I personally think a short sleeve, you know, ill fitting short sleeve shirt with a tie is dorky looking." And, and I thought about it. well, one, any ill fitting short shirt with a tie looks bad. Yeah, but yeah, correct. I can't think of another circumstance in which it would be acceptable to wear a short sleeve shirt with a tie than as a pilot. Like that, w- when would you ever do that? You would look like an idiot. So he does make a point. <laughs> that being said, the problem with the long sleeve shirt is you're not allowed to roll up the sleeves. Uh, it, it, you know, when you're wearing it as a uniform. Well, it's tacky. Yeah, but that, I mean, it's, it, that's like the cool, like, I'm on some network sitcom show and I'm cool sort of look, but <clears throat> that's not what people want. You know, I mean, I've been wearing long sleeves for a long time now, and there's something to be said about when people uh, come up and and say something about how you look in your uniform, and there's, (laughs) you're right, it just looks weird, short sleeves and ties, like like we're selling vacuums door to door or something, Hmm. you know? Well, so you have to understand, at the airline I work for, 
if somebody, so, so your airline, Roy, if, if the captain walks up and has a blazer and a hat on that doesn't, that doesn't, you don't bat an eye, right? At our airline, if somebody walks up with a blazer and a hat on, you're like, whoa, all right. What's, what's with this guy? Like what, what is going on here? What, what are we in? It's usually, you're usually guilty and guilty until proven innocent at that point. You're already, you're like, oh, and cause, and, and, and people that have had reputations in the past of being difficult, oftentimes also wore a blazer and a hat. Cause it's not, it's not required at our airline. So, but you can do it. You can buy one and you can wear it, but you don't have to. So like 1% of people wear it, which, so that's a whole, so the hat or blazer or one or either or both is, is very suspect. And to a much lesser level, long sleeves is just, you, you kind of raise an eyebrow, like, huh? So do you feel I think like, <laughs> Roy, do you feel like you're guilty until proven innocent? I guess you're the captain, so you don't really care. <laughs> and, and honestly, like I could care less, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the uniform that I'm required to, and I'm wearing it, uh, proudly. And yeah, I like long sleeves. Keeps my arms from getting all burnt. Well, the other uh, thing too is it would be kind of weird putting a blazer on with short sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody does. Everybody in the industry, does. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I guess. I guess you're right. But that is kind of a weird move too. I'd never considered that. I, I, and when when COVID supply issues were happening, everybody was in a panic because a certain shirt manufacturer that everybody loves was so behind in delivering things and people were just like, Whoa, I don't know what to do. And you know who, you know, what didn't ever run out of supplies were long sleeve shirts at every one of the companies. And, and it's been great. I never have to wait for it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, it's easy. But, and then again, who cares? Like, yeah, there's, there maybe people like don't want to be out there, but you know, I've had people ask me like, "Do you have long? You have tattoos on your arms?" And I'm like, "Do I look like a guy?" That <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the other See, thing. that's the thing. You know? That's it. <laughs> that's the thing. I've flown with with some dudes that definitely had tattoos on their arms, and you could like, you could kind of look at them and be like, "Okay, I know exactly okay. what this guy's." That guy wearing. was in a band, and he's wearing yeah, long like, sleeves. Okay, this There's is cool. This. Well, that's remember Max just the other day. Our buddy was telling us he flew with a dude that would. Oh no, he was all he was super cool, but he was all about the blazer at Southwest. And he'd like yeah. try and convince the other guy to get wear the blazer, and he's like, "It's really funny, and let's watch everyone's reactions." And so they'd like wear it just to like troll everybody, I guess. I don't know who, yeah, who knew funny. that like wearing it's your whole thing. uniform was a troll move. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's <clears throat> maybe for some, but for others, it's it's you know all those sweet old ladies at the airport that come up and say like, "Oh, you 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 just look so dapper in your uniform," and you're just like, "Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for flying X Y Z." It's more about on. having Have a great day. see the uniform is what it is, but it's about the fit and the things yeah. you actually can control. Like so, like people, some of these people wear like the cheapest shoes from Kohl's and like these baggy pants, and you're just like, "You look terrible." Yeah. Put some, yeah. At least. Keep and the shirt doesn't make you a jerk. You're a jerk regardless, you know? That's so, true. like, don't let the, the, that sit there and be like, well, I don't want to have that stigma. Like, do what you do what you want to do, man. <laughs> and be an awesome person to everybody else and be professional and elevate yourself and your, and your colleagues that's and your it. career. It's all, and if you do it with long sleeves or short sleeves, who gives a just crap? Don't, that's what I always say is don't make the easiest job in the world hard. You actually have to put effort <laughs> in to make it difficult for people around yes. you. Just – let it be easy because then it's the greatest thing ever if you let it be. And Absolutely. It's, it's hilarious that some people cannot get out of their own way and their own head to try and make things difficult. I just flew somebody like that. Yeah. I was just like, why do you do this? This is so, so much more effort to be a jerk. Okay, last, <laughs> last question on this. There, I, the, the only like legitimate reason I can think, or not legit, but one of the main things is like heat. Right. So, Roy, do you, I mean, you've got to get hot sometimes in the long sleeve. That would be like my uh, main I argument. Mean, I stopped flying airplanes that weren't air conditioned like many years ago. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> and look at the people that live in very hot, uh, deserty climates. You know, they're not wearing short sleeves, <laughs> they're covering all their skin. And mm. so, it's been scientifically proven that covering your skin and, and, you know, not having that direct radiant energy hitting your flesh is going to keep you cooler. 
So to each their own, man. Yeah. It's, it, but the funny thing is though, I'll tell you this. I have flown with somebody that put, um, that wore short sleeves, but then when he got in the cockpit, he put on like ar- little white arm sleeves for the sun protection. And I was like, okay, this yeah. is uh, wow. <laughs> this is a the lot. Stigmas are real. Well, we're running into the same thing. Last thing, Roy, and then we'll let you go. Well, Cause we've run into this stigma thing too. When we, ta- we've been doing all these luggage reviews and then we kept talking about the travel pro bag. And then people, people are very heated. Like that's a flight attendant bag, you know? And, it goes back and forth, and it just seems like this is kind of in the same vein, like the long sleeve shirt. Like there's just certain things that people can observe about people. Yeah, and if if you really care about first impressions, then you know, and and that's something important to you. Do with it what you will. But I think that there's, <laughs> it's funny what pilots are going to gripe about. Like where they literally like, oh, you're one of those long sleeve guys. I'm like, what does that mean? You know? And then you're like, well, what if I have tattoos? And then all of a sudden they paint themselves in this corner. And I'm like, dude, I'm just kidding with you. Like I, I just always warn these, I, my, my arms don't get burned and I think it looks better. You could do whatever you want. The manual permits you to have those, those opportunities. So <laughs> enjoy them. And like Max said, this is such an easy career. Have fun doing it and, and, and have fun with each other. And why are we constantly like belittling one another over something so yeah, stupid? No. As at sleeves? the end of the day, dude, it doesn't matter at all. And it's just kind of funny. So, nah, that's right. Humor. All right, Matt. Well, hopefully, we answered your question. You do you. Uh, it'll probably be easier to acquire long sleeve shirts. So, it is a benefit. I don't know. Is, the cost, is there a cost difference? I haven't really examined the, the pricing. It's more material, but. Uh, Demand is probably less. I don't even so. know. Who knows? Yeah, I don't. I don't even know. But it's awesome. Join the club. We have meetings once a quarter. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> Long sleeve slash no tattoo Facebook group. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Exactly. Tat free. Uh, all right, Roy. Uh, thank you for all of your insight today, and uh, good good catching up with you. Likewise, enjoy the rest of your day, all right, boys. Roy. See ya. Good talk. See you, man. Uh, all right, I'll read this short email and then I'll let you finish off with the long one here. Um, this was uh, from Cliff, who's a longtime listener of the show and he works in IT. Uh, he, he sent us an email regarding uh, Crandall from Hard Landing. He said, Dude is an effing assassin. I've spent my whole life in tech. Reminds me of Gertzner from my IBM days. I bet they were pals. And he set a, a, a YouTube link. Um, to an interview with uh, Gertzner, uh, who was an executive at IBM and like came in and like basically helped them pivot to change when there was big tech technological changes. And um, it was actually a pretty good good, good clip he had sent. It was, it was pretty have you never seen so. a picture of Bob Crandall though? I mean, with the hair slicked oh. back, and he, he actually yeah. does have like sharp teeth. Yeah, <laughs> he's just like it's, a, it's a, but he's like tall and lanky. Yeah, he's just he's but he's an imposing dude. It's, it's interesting. Yes. All right, last email, Max. Go ahead. Gents, huge fan of the show. Really appreciate what you do for the community. In the last episode on flight advice, you mentioned the gentleman reach out to, Timothy Pope, to plan out a 5, 10, or 15-year game plan to teach his financial goals. Oh, okay. I mean, this was the guy that was making 250 k like working in the oil rig or whatever, but wanted to be a pro pilot. Oh, okay. I think that's who he's... Remember that? Yeah, yeah, okay. From that discussion. Yeah. Got it. I'm in a similar situation. I'm a military rotor wing pilot, have around 2,000 of rotary twin turbine time, and about 300 hours fixed wing with commercial rating. I'd like to fly corporate someday with the ultimate goal of going exclusively contract in something like a PC-12. When I retire from the military in five years, my family and I will likely settle down in the New Hampshire Seacoast area, which is where Plain Sense is uh, headquartered. I think that might be the best place to cut my teeth and gain more fixed wing total time. The seven on seven off is not ideal for me. However, and that's why I'd like to eventually get to contract work. I will have a military pension, lifetime healthcare benefits for me and the wife. So I'm not overly concerned with the salary and benefits. I'm more focused on finding a good work life balance. If I can either pick and choose trips or work a set schedule that is only a few days a week, that would be ideal. My question is, who's the best consultant I should contact to help me lay out a 5- to 15-year plan? Looks like Tim is mostly focused on finances, but I could be wrong. Also, are there any opportunities I'm not thinking of that might meet this aspirational lifestyle? Thanks, guys. Keep up the awesome work from Grimace. So, yeah, Tim. Tim's a financial planner, so he'll definitely be able to help you out on the financial side of planning things. But I think he's asking more a first for a career strategic career plan. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, of course, our, our friend James over at Raven Careers, you can find the link in the show notes. He uh, he is good for career planning and just kind of helping you organize your goals and letting you yeah figure that out. But but here's my sense on this: if you do the math on being a full time contractor, especially on something smaller, um, to to make to if you do that versus a part 91 flight department that doesn't fly a ton, right? We're talking a couple hundred yep. hours a year, right? 150, 200 hours a year. Uh, if you do the math on that to make the same amount of money, you actually work quite a bit harder oftentimes as a contract pilot, not to mention you're working for free until you pay back your expenses, uh, primarily mm-hmm. in training. So if I were you knowing what I know now, I would probably, you know, it sounds like you know where you want to live, which is half the battle, right? So you need to do some research and it always comes back to you. And this is what James is going to tell you too, is networking, right? Um, and, and find out, get your eyes set or your sights, I'm sorry, set on a job that, that meets those goals and figure out where those people are and what, what kind of airplanes they fly and maybe going to, um, Plain sense is, is, is a thing if, if the PC 12 is it, or maybe you go somewhere else or you go to net jets. Um, if, if there's a lot of, uh, types that to get the net jets operates to get your foot in the door and get the experience and get the type rating and everything else. And then I would make your long-term plan. Your long-term play is to get to one of those 91 lower utilization yeah. flight departments, because that's always the best bang for your buck. And a lot of times has the best perks and everything else. I mean, that, if it were, if, if money and control of my schedule had, had did not, and benefits didn't factor into this aviation thing, the 91 corporate pilot for somebody cool is the best gig there is. Yes. Period. That's it. I mean, it, it is the Period. best. Period. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. I was, I was right along the same lines. I like the strategic plan of going to a fractional or somewhere where that is structured because after you get out of the military, you're going to need to learn how to fly civilian. And I would recommend going to a big operator that has procedures and uh, operations manuals and IOE and flying with a training captain, all those things. Go bang that out for a year or two. And yeah, maybe seven on seven off won't work. And th- th- you know there are other options and maybe maybe it's not plain sense. Maybe it's somebody else. But I love that move for a year or two to get yourself acclimated, learn the industry, make sure that's what you want to be in. And then I agree with Max. It's a part 91 job is what you want. Um, probably. It's too hard to plan like exactly like I'm going to fly the PC 12. I, I wouldn't really plan that far in advance. I'd say you can't tie yourself to a plane, especially if you want to live in Portsmouth, what airplanes are there, you know, could be the thing. Um, so you, you want to start doing recon there, but I think that foundational move out of the military, that first job, that's not really where you want to be in that part 91 job yet. You want to fly, get a lot of reps, build your, build your, um, experience then I think you make that nice move over to a 91 operator. Maybe it's a King Air. Uh, maybe it's a TBM. We don't know. And uh, to your point, you know, where, where some of the things you don't need because you get from the military retirement, you could take a job that a lot of people would pass on. Um, so I think you actually will fit a really nice niche. So I think there will be a demand for somebody that's, that you can say, hey, listen, I live in this city. I'm not going anywhere. I don't have any dreams to fly for Delta or, you know, run and chase, you know, climb the career ladder. Um, so I think, I think you're on the right track, but boy, to, 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 I don't know. It's, it's very difficult to plan to that precise of a detail 15 years from now where what's going to happen. Yeah, that's going to be totally. really tough, but build that foundation. I think that's, that's the way. And still talk to Tim. Cause I think he can help you plan and figure out what it is, you know, what, what type of job when you get out of the military, what is the minimum you're going to need to make, you know? How do you manage some of that stuff? Those could be some really good uh, strategic questions for him. So, uh, good email. All right. Okay, that's going to do it for the mailbag. Thanks to everyone who wrote in. Uh, you can be a part of the conversation if you shoot us an email, info at 215podcast.com or visit 
the website, 215podcast.com, and click on the Flight Advice tab because coming up next, you can hear what we do best, which is dispense our thoughts on people's quandaries. You can submit the anonymous form on the website. We'll do our best to give you some perspective. Of course, Flight Advice is brought to you by Harvey Watt. They are the largest provider of loss of medical insurance in the entire world. Over 70,000 professional pilots trust Harvey Watt to protect them and their families if they were ever to lose their medical. We just talked about it earlier, Max. It's the lifespan versus the uh, well, health span. Is that the health other span term? versus lifespan? That's yeah. right. Maybe Harvey Watt needs to figure out the health span calculator. <laughs> they can get, ooh, they can need a lot of coverage there. So, HarveyWatt.com, check out all of their offerings for, for professional pilots. On to flight advice. Here we go, Max. This will be one of our favorite topics here. It says, uh, this is from Alex. He says, I'm a 28 year old CFI living and working in Austin, Texas. I have no real debt. I'm single and no children that I know of. I'm approaching 500 hours and planning on finishing up my multi in the next month or two. My ultimate goal is to be at an airline, but I'm not in a real rush to do so. Business aviation interests me as well. I've been listening to the show for a while now and have been considering following your all's advice and leaving the state region country to do something cool while I am still young and single instead of rushing to a regional. Yes. Recently, I made an Aussie pilot friend who wants some help ferrying a plane back through small islands in the South Pacific and asked if I wanted to join. It sounds like it would be great flying and life experience. Plus, I've always wanted to travel through that region. While I always say I'm pretty much willing to move anywhere and do anything as long as I can log the time, I'm hesitant to quit my CFI job to do stuff like this when once it's over, I'll only have 600-ish hours. I've been networking as much as possible and have made some good connections, but I don't have... Uh, but don't have a job or any gainful employment that I could count on upon my return. My concern is with low hours and a CFI job that probably won't hire me back if I leave to go do something like this, I could end up high and dry and stall my flying career before it even really begins. What would you all do if you were in my shoes? Any places you would try and go or jobs you would try and do? Ideally, something that would impress employers later on. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. That's from Alex. So is he going to be paid for this fairing? That he did not really disclose. Because <laughs> I'm wondering well, how small this plane is. Because one, it doesn't like ferry, don't, like if it's a 172 or something like that, yeah, you taking, take a second person. I don't know, because you have like gas and you have you know, like fuel tanks and stuff. So, so I'm, we got to assume this is a bigger plane. Two, I guess, can you log this time? I don't, I mean, that's like it's a, we we need to know what kind of airplane this is. I think. Yeah, but the thing is, though, it's like things like this is exactly how you mm-hmm. get a foot in the door for something yeah. next, right? Yep. Um, but at some point, you're going to have to just send it and see what happens. And so, <clears throat> it's one of those things where the opportunities to be able to do something like this. And just send it and say, I don't have a job when I get back, but I'm just going to figure it out. Get smaller and smaller as you get older and older. So if you have nothing holding you down, you're single, no debt, no kids, I would go for it. Because there's like, I'll give you a small example that's sort of relevant. But when I was a flight instructor at Embry-Riddle, I got chosen to take a uh, one of the twins there, I think it was a, a seminal at the time to Oshkosh, right. For the school. And it was, we were going to be there for a week and this whole thing. And then one of my best friends also got selected to go. And I ended up foregoing that opportunity to take an earlier class at the regional because of the, uh, because of seniority. And oh, I've always about this. regretted that not doing that. Cause it was, what a don't like it. I would have much rather had those memories than the freaking whatever it was, 60 numbers of seniority or something for an airline. I stayed at for a year and a half tops. Like that was just dumb. That's, 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 it's just a small taste of one of the very few things I can say that I really regretted in my career. And I have a feeling that's something you'll look back up and be like, God, that would have been so cool instead of, you know, going doing slow flight for the 900th time in the practice area. Or, you know, whatever. So, Mm -hmm. and who knows? It could be just that. And then you end up coming home and you have to go stay with your parents and you have no job. But 
figure it out. And you'll always have that story and that experience to, and, and that, and those kind of experiences sometimes may be the difference of you getting the job of your dreams yes. because you had a freaking story to tell versus uh, telling about your type rating experience in the CRJ, you know, 700, like nobody cares. So yeah, hundred percent agree. Yeah. Send it. Uh, Let us know what happens. <laughs> yeah. And here, here's what I, what I was thinking, Alex, if you do a good job of taking some videos and photos and, and, uh, we can share it to our yeah. listeners. Cause I think it'd be pretty interesting and you never know, maybe somebody listening or watching will be like, Oh, that did, that's cool. That guy, well, guy took a risk and, and, uh, let's talk to him. And this, this just sounds like the beginning of a story that ends yeah. with like, oh, and the Aussie friend, he introduced me to yeah. this dude, and then I ended up flying this here, and then that led into yeah. this here, and, and then I was flying a Twin Otter and floats in the Maldives, and next thing I knew, and then I went and got a, a, you know, a real job and was an airline pilot for the next 20 years, but the rest of the time yeah. was awesome. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Those 20 years sucked, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, listen, that's, that's a, at some point, you have to get grow up and get a real, get, get a real yeah, job. Yeah, you, you have to get a real job. No, that's you know? a good point. You yeah, go I, from having multiple jobs to having a career, and that's... That's right. Some point. That's right. But. No, I agree. Go for it. You will... Worst case, I think you will find a CFI job somewhere when you yeah, get back. Yeah, I mean, come on. And it'll be... And, and you know what? Maybe you'll, you'll love ferrying. And you'll be like, dude, this was super cool. And you email the, all the different ferrying companies. You're like, hey, I just did this. Uh, you know, uh, let me know if there's any other opportunities. You've, you've now got that box you can kind of check. So Yeah, or you get a job flying at Cessna Caravan out of Pelu in the South Pacific because you met some chick whose dad is the chief pilot. You know, you never know. Who knows? <laughs> That we'll let you write open. the rest of the story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here, if you do this trip, though, you have to promise to send us some videos, some content, so we can follow along now because this sounds awesome. You, you with sitting like a a huge bladder of fuel on your lap in the in a Piper yeah. Lance. <laughs> 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 Is that Majuro? <laughs> uh, all right, that uh, is going to do it for flight advice. Uh, visit the website uh, twenty five podcast dot com for the anonymous link. Fill in the information with your question. And we'll be happy to tackle. Uh, oh, I forgot. The, the best part is he inter- he had uh, addressed this to Eagle Careers. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's really why I chose this. Good, good work, Alex. Uh, fill out that form on our website, and uh, we will be happy to, to give our input, which is worth exactly what you paid for it. Okay. Max, I've got to run to a doctor's appointment. It's time to go. Quickly. Anything? Any, uh, any uh, closing thoughts here? Did you nope. enjoy the surprise from Roy? That was fun. Uh, always, Dylan. Yeah. Your surprises are just always tickle me. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Thanks to Roy for calling in, sharing his insight. Thanks to all our listeners for contributing. Harvey Watt, Advanced Air Crew Academy, Tim Pope, Ferris Jet Sales, and the Air Comp Calculator, all of our longtime supporters of the program. Couldn't do without all of you. We will be back next week with another episode. But until then, remember... Flexibility is the key to air power. We'll see you next time. And aircraft uh, ferrying. (laughs) Good luck, Alex. Full send, late 20s. Full send it. Love it. (laughs) Flexibility. (laughs) Air power. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.